So I'm happy to, to see you all. And uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce Lean Lambas and Fernando Orejas, who want to give a talk today. Uh, both old friends of mine, uh, uh, but that's not why they're here, at least not exclusively. Um, so, so Lean is in, in Potsdam, Fernando is in, in Barcelona. They've started working on um, sort of various things together, uh, uh, including negative application conditions and logic and graph transformation uh, for, for, for some time now. Uh, but this particular talk is on confluence. Uh, that means confluence uh, in the sense of, of um, sort of applying rules and, 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 and allowing them to, uh, uh, to join again if they, if they create conflict. So, so I'll hand over to Lean, I think, who will make a, make a start, but, but it's a double act. So, so they sort of hand over to each other while, while, while they're presenting. Please, Lean. Okay, thank you, Reiko. Uh, indeed, Reiko already um, introduced nicely the topic. We will talk about confluence of graph transformation, and we will start immediately with an example, as Reiko said also, right? Um, we, we are interested in confluence for graph transformation or for graph transformation rules. This means I take my pointer that um, when we apply two rules here, a delete rule and an add rule to the same graph, we are interested in knowing if after rule application, we will be able to join um, together these applications and obtain a common result graph again. Now, um, as you can see in this example, this will not be immediately possible <clears throat> because um, the rule application on the left deletes an edge that is needed in, in this bigger graph um, for applying again rule add the same way as it has been applied here. So by adding a leaf here to the node four, this is not possible anymore because node three and this edge has disappeared. Yeah, That's why here we have a conflicting situation. Now we have two rules that compete for the same resource. <clears throat> so we have a kind of delete read or a delete use conflict here. And um, this means that we cannot make this situation immediately confluent. Again, this is possible in a few steps when we would apply here the delete rule then to this result graph, we will be able to obtain the same graph again, but it's not uh, it's not so obvious at first sight, right? So we are interesting in um, finding automatic techniques that help us to decide this question when I have two conflicting situations, <clears throat> when I have two uh, direct transformation pairs or graph transformations that are conflicting, compete for the same resource, will I be able to reach the same graph again at some point? And typically in graph transformation, what we do is, yeah, we can um, give a yes answer whenever it is clear that the graph transformation rule with which we start <clears throat> the transformation system are terminating and um, we have investigated the so-called finite and representative set of conflicts, which are all possible conflicts in a kind of minimal conflict for strict confluence. Um, <clears throat> we will see later what this exactly means. Um, and then we can say that we will definitely reach such a, a, a yes answer. Otherwise, we don't really know. Yeah, we, we cannot say automatically yes or no. We just can say in some cases, yes. Um, this type of analysis is used um, in model-driven engineering in order to determine if model transformations that are modeled using graph transformation, um, if, they are, if they have a unique result or if they have functional behavior. This has been, for example, applied to um, analyzing model transformations from class diagrams to relational database schemes, for example. So here you see the more detailed picture. Confluence analysis and graph transformation typically consists of termination analysis. And then um, <clears throat> this is the part that we will 
um, talk about today um, about um, yeah, analyzing that a finite and representative set of conflicts is um, strict confluence. So when we find this, these confluence situations for conflicts in a minimal context, we will be able to say that the whole system is confluent and we will have functional behavior. Now, as you have seen, a key issue is that we need this finite and representative set of conflicts in order to be able to give this yes answer in confluence analysis. But um, just analyzing um, conflicts as a whole and understanding how these conflicts arise at all is a topic, a research topic for, yeah, for itself and uh, can be applied to different use cases. So there we are not really interested in seeing that a conflict really is going to be confluent. We just want to know where are the conflicts hidden, so to say. When can rules compete for the same resources and why can this happen? And this can, for example, be used for detecting conflicting requirements, for example, in software engineering, when we model them again, um, for example, by refining use cases and their activities with graph transformation rules. So then the idea is to again compute this finite and representative set of conflicts for given graph transformation rules, um, and then inspect usually manually this set in order to really understand, okay, which type of conflicts can occur in my system and is it natural that they occur or not? Uh, if not, I can maybe repair my rules. Um, so yeah, this is what the talk will be about. So we will be um, interested in finding for graph transformation rules such finite and representative set of conflicts for the whole system. And not only for plain rules, as you have seen in the example before, also for rules that are a bit more, um, that have more descriptive complexity, so they can carry so-called application conditions. And we are not only interested in finding such a finite set, but in order to make the confluence analysis and conflict analysis, and for example, this man manual inspection of, of this finite set as efficient as possible, we are interested in finding minimal such sets. And with this introduction, I'd like to hand over to Fernando, who will um, continue with first theoretical findings on this topic. Yes. Okay. So uh... What I will do in, in my part of the talk is first do some introduction to some basic results that one should know, and then go on to talk about what happens with the plane in the plane rules case. Then Lin will continue with uh, rules with application condition. Oops. Okay. Uh, before, the first thing that we are going to see is uh, or almost the first thing that we are going to see is what does it mean to, for a set to be representative? Or at least what kind of sets that we can build of conflicts, sets of conflicts can be considered representative. But before that, let's see some, uh, oops. Yeah. So uh, in, in general, the, the approach to try to prove confluence is to prove some some property which is weaker than in general weaker than confluence which is local confluence so in confluence you uh, you care whether any kind of uh, graphs or terms or whatever you are rewriting or transforming uh, any pair, kind of pair of these uh, objects that you can obtain by by any any number of steps of, of transformation may be joined into a common object afterwards. While in local conference, as you probably know, we only care about one step transformation and about pairs that can be obtained by one step transformation. Then whether they can be joined, maybe more than one step transformation. So in general, local conference is not equivalent to conference, but as you probably know, I don't know why, yeah. Are you passing Lynn the, the slides? Okay. 
uh, yeah, so the, as you probably know, there's a lemma, an old lemma from uh, Newman's in 1942 that uh, tells us that uh, if, uh, a if a relation is terminating, then it is confluent if, it, if and only if it is locally confluent. So this means that uh, assuming that we work with terminating sequences of, of transformations, it's enough to look about uh, for locally confluent uh, to see if they are locally confluent. Now, so, um, some of the ideas, or many I don't know, of the ideas that I used in, in for checking confluence, at least the original ideas that I used for checking confluence in, gra in, in graph transformation come from, from time writing systems, where we know that if uh, a system, a time writing system is confluent, so it's terminating, then confluence is decidable and local confluence is decidable. Unfortunately, in, so I have, okay. Unfortunately, in the case of graph transformation, Detlef Plum proved in 93 that confluence and local confluence are undecidable for graph transformation systems, even if they are terminating. This was, in principle, the first time I, I heard about this, I found it a bit surprising. Afterwards, I learned that it's not so surprising because in, in time writing systems, if, uh, if we work only with ground term writing so that the, the terms don't include variables, then local confluence and confluence are undecidable as in graph transformation. And actually in, in graph transformation, maybe not in all approaches, but in DPO, graphs and rules don't have variables. So the situation is in a way similar to the case of, of term writing system. Nevertheless, uh, well, let's start to see what does it mean for a, 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 for a set of, of, of conflicts to be representative. Yeah, uh, well, before that, sorry. In order to see, to study uh, conflicts and so on, so one kind of, of characterization that it's nice to know is that of parallel independence. So when you, we can be sure that there's no conflict directly. Uh, in the case of term writing, the corresponding notion of parallel independence would mean that uh, the you apply a term, two, two rules to a term where the application of the two rules are a, have empty intersections so are disjoint. So in, in, in this case, we know that there's, there's not going to be any interference between both applications and they are going to be, they, they, they will not create any conflict. In the case of graph transformation, this is a slightly more complex because we may allow not only the case where the two applications of the application of two rules don't share any uh, disjoint, they don't share any, any element, but we may also allow that they share elements which belong to the interface part of, 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 the, of the application. So the part that is not that is not uh, modified by, by the graph transformation. So in this case, D1 and D2. And uh, well, the characterization or the definition of parallel independence also you probably know, means that you know that two, the application of two rules is parallel independent uh, to a, if the application to a graph G, if these two morphisms D21 and D12 exist such that they commute with the other a morphism in the diagram. And if this happens, then we know that there's not going to be that this pair of transformations are not in conflict. If uh, this happens, we have parallel independence, then uh, one of the classical results of, of term of sorry, of graph transformation is the local choice Russell theorem. 
for independent, parallel independent applications, where we know that if two rule applications are parallel independent, they immediately confl uh, are confluent in, in just one rule application. So if we apply M1 and M2 to get H1 and H2, then we can immediately apply M1, sorry, R1, not M1, but R1 to H2 and R2 to H1. So in a way that we get a common graph H. So the problem is, the problem we may have in general is when they are not, when we have a, a pair of, 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 of uh, transformation, which is not, which are not parallel independent. In this case, the situation typically where, where we have uh, this kind of conflict is when we have what it's called a delete use conflict. A delete use conflict in the case of, uh, of, uh, in the case of, of, gra of uh, graph transformation with plain rules, rules with no condition, means that as uh, Lynn showed you in, in the first example, she showed that uh, one rule may delete some elements that are needed by the application of the other rules so that we can converge into, into a common graph H. So this is the example more or less that was used by Lin. So in this case, we have uh, that this rule uh, deletes this arrow and the node uh, one and the arrow but this, uh, this uh, the application of L2 is assuming that this arrow and this node exist. So here the L2 may be applied to the to the to graph G. But if you first apply rule one to to G, then this has disappeared, and we cannot apply anymore uh, rule L2, rule two. Now, in general, if we consider conflicts all, all parallel dependent pairs, we have an, an infinite number of, of conflicts. So as uh, Lynn said, we would need to try to reduce this, this number of, of conflicts to a finite number. Uh, in this sense, the idea I, I won't. I won't tell you what is the classical approach, but I will tell you a bit, little bit later. But in, in, in the sense of this talk, what we are going first to to study is what does it mean for a conflict to be represented by another conflict? What does it mean that a conflict represents other conflicts? And the idea is that. Uh, we can consider that. Uh, that a, a certain pair of, of transformation, uh, G to H1 and G to H2, represents a co another, co another pair like uh, G prime to H1 prime and G prime to H2 prime. If we have a, a, a morphism that we call an extension morphism, that in a way embeds the first pair of transformations into the second pair of transformation or extends the first pair to the second pair of transformations. If this morphism H is a, a, a injective, is a monomorphism, then we call, we say that this is an M extension. If it's just a normal morphism, an arbitrary morphism, then we call this an extension. So if we think that this is the idea or a possible idea for a, a pair of transformations to represent another pair of transformations, then a, that, a, that a set of transformations represent another set of pair of transformations can be defined as a, with a notion of completeness or M completeness. The idea here is that uh, a set S is complete with respect to another set S prime. If uh, every pair of transformations in S prime has a pair of transformation in S that can be extended to the second pair. So that uh, 
there is this transformation H1, H2 that uh, can be extended to H1 prime to, to H2 prime. We can see that uh, this notion is a reasonable notion of representing of representing transform a pairs of transformations and in general conflicts, because uh, one can show the following confluence or local confluence theorem that tells us that uh, a transformation system is locally confluent if every conflict in a complete or M complete set is strictly confluent. So this, this theorem was uh, proved by the first time, not exactly in this formulation by Plump for hypergraphs. And then it was extended to other kinds of graphs by Erich, Havel, Pavel, and Prang. And then uh, uh, to arbitrary M, uh, to arbitrary M complete uh, or complete systems, in this case M complete, by this more recent paper. So this means that if we work with this notion of completeness or M completeness, we can have a notion of representative, of representativity. So here we have this overview, where now we have uh, expanded a little bit the what we had in the overview, which was in the original overview, where now we have two kinds of uh, things that we have to prove or to check is uh, whether for plain rules, rules with NACs and rules with ACs, we can find finite and M complete set of conflicts and whether they are minimal. And similarly for completeness. For M completeness, what well, it's uh, the notion that is uh, that can be used to to find M complete sets of transformations is the notion of critical pair. Uh, this notion comes from, from time of writing and the idea is to, to get the conflict into a minimal context. It was originally formulated by Detlef in 93 and then it was uh, like in, in the previous theorem extended to other kinds of graphs uh, in, and then to all kinds of adhesive categories. And uh, the idea here, so the idea, as I said, is to have a minimal context and this can be obtained by when you have a, 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 a dependent, a parallel uh, dependent transformation uh, to ask the, 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 the graph here, K, to be and morphism M1 and M2 to be these two morphisms to be jointly epimorphic. So that this means that every element of K comes from L1 or from L2 or from both, obviously. So this is the original notion of, of critical pair for graph transformation rules without conditions. And here you have an example. So it's a, if you remember the previous example that I used, that was the, the example that Lin used initially, uh, in that, in the graph G that we were using, we had many more things. So if we just restrict to the minimum kind of, of the minimal uh, kind of, of elements, the minimum amount of elements, which is uh, just making this M1 and M2 to make, uh, to be uh, uh, epimorphic, uh, jointly epimorphic, uh, then we get this critical pair. So the critical pair in here would be this, all this, this graph, all the, the two pairs of transformations. And uh, what it can be proved, that was proved originally by Plump, is that uh, the set of critical pairs is M complete with respect to the sets of conflicts of two rules. And it's finite also, unless the, the rules have uh, infinite graphs, which is typically not the case. But not only we have that, but uh, we have proved that uh, not only it is minimally complete, and I rec minimally means that it's minimally complete means that uh, that it has the least uh, possible number, uh, the least possible cardinality, so that uh, there are no other co m complete sets 
with a smaller cardinality. So we not only proved, which is quite simple actually, that this set is minimal, but also that any minimal set, M complete set of, of conflicts is uh, exactly the set of critical pairs up to isomorphism, obviously. The problem with critical pairs is that in general, we have too many and it's uh, too, we have to, it takes too much time to compute them in general exponential time. Uh, so in a few years ago, well, 12 years already ago, we defined some variation on critical pairs, some reduced amount of critical pairs, which were called essential critical pairs. Uh, and it was proved that this essential critical pairs were complete, so not incomplete, but complete. But then later it was proved that they were not minimal. And this was part of the, the next approach to graph transformation. But before we, we do the overview, so we know that for M completeness, we have a M complete sets or so representative sets which are finite and minimal. Now, and for, for complete sets of conflicts, we have that essentially essential critical pairs are uh, complete, but not minimally complete. So the idea to try to even reduce more the set of conflicts that one has to inspect to check for confluence uh, came from, in a way, category theory. So in category theory, in general, when you want to have some kind of notion of minimality, you, you use initiality. So this is the notion of initial conflict. So a pair of transformation is initial or M initial with respect to another pair of transformation if two conditions hold. One is that TP prime is an extension of TP. And the other one, and here comes initiality, for every other TP second, double prime, uh, that can be extended to T prime, there is a unique extension or M extension from TTP to TP. Uh, second such that H is the composition of H prime and H second. And then a conflict is initial if the if uh, its own initial uh, transformation, it's only a pair of transform a conflict is initial if it's its own initial conflict. So this in this case, in this example, you can see that the critical pair that we have built before is an initial conflict. But for instance, this other critical pair is not an initial conflict because this conflict, uh, well, the conflict would be the, the, the pair of transformations, but, but the, from this, this graph can be embedded into this one via this morphism that maps uh, the nodes two and six, two, four and six into a single node. So this is this would be one of the critical pairs that we wouldn't have to to look at if uh, if we would work with initial conflicts instead of with uh, critical pairs. A problem that uh, we found was that uh, in this original paper about initial conflicts, we were able to to prove that typed graphs have initial conflicts, but it's not ensured that we will have initial conflicts for any arbitrary category, adhesive category. Fortunately, Atsi, Corradini, and Ribeiro proved, provide some sufficient conditions that ensure that almost all reasonable M adhesive categories of, 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 uh, of graphical structures uh, have initial conflicts. And what one can prove then is that the set of initial conflicts is complete with respect to the set of all conflicts for two rules P1 and P2. This was proved in that paper introducing initial conflicts. And then what we proved again now, like in the case of critical pairs, is that not only this, uh, this set of conflicts is minimal, but also that uh, any minimal set of uh, any minimal complete set of conflicts is exactly the set of initial conflicts up to isomorphism. So to conclude with my part, we have now that for plane rules, 
we have positive answers to all the questions. So we have uh, M complete sets of conflicts and complete sets of conflicts and both are A, both are minimal. And uh, Lynn can continue now. Uh, pardon, Lin. Uh, I think you are you are muted. Could you double check, please? Does it work now? Yes. Uh, thank you. Okay. Thanks. Um, I was having a conflicting message here. Uh, my screen um, said that uh, I'm I'm not muted, but my other device said that I'm muted. Um, okay. Let's see if I can. And the pointer, and then I'll start with my part. So, yeah, we are we are going to uh, see what now happens for the case of application conditions, and we will start immediately with the more complex application conditions uh, that, um, as shown by Hagel and Penemann in 2009, are equivalent to first order logic on on graphs. And that's because they are able, these application conditions, to require um, some additional uh, conditions that need to hold for the matches of a graph transformation in the sense that they can work with, um, with existential and for all quantification in the sense that they can require um, for another pattern to exist in addition to the left-hand side, of course. No? And then for this additional pattern that one in addition um, looks for, some other condition again should hold. And this is why they were called in the beginning also nested application conditions, no? because we are we can yeah start when using these existential uh, quantifiers to nest conditions into each other and also to combine them with the usual logical connectors. Um, so what does it mean? for such an application condition to be satisfied. So you can imagine that this here is a match into a routine from a left-hand side of a graph transformation rule, then an application condition, such an existential one as this one here, is satisfied whenever one can find the morphism that finds this additional pattern that I was talking before um, about. And then the, the this inner condition is satisfied by um, the morphism that um, makes sure that this additional pattern exists. So this is how satisfaction is yeah, defined for these um, um, quite complex application conditions. But an example of such an application condition is a negative application condition. Then basically we just check that this extra pattern that we are looking for doesn't exist. And that's it. Then the condition here is just um, trivially true. Um, so what changes now when we have application conditions is that on the left hand side we have such a thing in us, we have this um, predicate here, this extra one, and the match doesn't only have to exist, so we don't only have to find the pattern L into the uh, bigger context G, we also have to check that this match satisfies this extra condition. On this example, um, application condition here, which is not nested, so it's quite simple still, but it at least uses negation. So it's a neg and a pack, a negative and a positive application condition with a disjunction in between them. So one can choose arbitrarily, and here we choose to do it like this. So this means that um, this match here would satisfy the application condition. If we don't find this pattern, and this is the case, that's why it's satisfied no, already. Um, but if we would have additional nodes, then we would need to jump over two additional nodes, so to say, no, we, would, we would at least um, need three nodes. This is what this application condition is, is telling us. 
so we can play a little bit more with when matches um, are to exist or not. And then, of course, the transformation mechanism changes a little bit. No? We, we get application conditions in the rule, but the notion of conflict basically stays the same. If we can't um, repeat the application um, that we have done here to the graph H1 anymore after the first other rule has applied to the same graph, then we have a conflict. And this means that we can still have delete use conflicts as before, but we now on also have so-called these AC conflicts. And they can occur together with delete use conflicts or with use delete conflicts, better said, because here it can still happen that the morphism doesn't exist. But an AC conflict is characterized by the fact that when uh, the second rule still finds what it needs to be applied without the application condition, then the application condition will be violated. This can now happen, of course, in addition, in order to create a conflict. So we find the extended match into the result of the first rule application, but then the application condition of the second rule is not satisfied. This happens here in this example um, that um, we have seen almost before. I think it's quite uh, similar. Um, we have here um, glued the nodes one and three. We have one extra node, which is okay with respect to this application condition. Um, but when we apply this rule here, then we violate the negative application condition here because now all of a sudden we have two additional nodes, and this shouldn't be the case for applying this rule. So yeah, therefore things become more complicated because we have this um, expressivity, which is like equivalent to first order logic. It's also natural that things become more complex, as we will see. And um, one of the things that become more complex is that in uh, the plain case, we had um, so-called inheritance of conflict. This means that when we have a, a conflict here for a big transformation, so to say, in a bigger context, uh, then this means that when, whenever we can make this transformation pair smaller, then we would have the conflict also in this smaller context. But this doesn't hold anymore as soon as we have first sort of logic in the application conditions and as soon as we have application conditions. Um, therefore, um, yeah, things become more complicated as we can see here. No? There's no conflict. I only have one additional node here um, and here. Um, I have two and therefore there is a conflict. Also the other um, way around, it doesn't hold now anymore that we have co-inheritance. So yeah, it's important when one wants to have um, still interesting properties and also to look at special cases. And one particular case that uh, is very special and uh, heavily used in practice is the case of negative application conditions. And as I told you before, this is a very simple form of application condition, which is not nested. And it just um, yeah, requires that some extra structure that is attached to the left-hand side shouldn't be there. Um, and it has been shown that um, we can also come up with a notion of critical pairs for rules with negative application condition. And that, as in the plain case, this notion is M complete. But what um, is not the case, and this is something we just um, discovered more or less because we just um, started thinking about this, is that they are um, minimally M complete. So um, this example shows what, what happens. And, and in this sense, the critical pairs for rules with max developed at that time. Um, 2006, I think it was, is not optimal in the M representative way yet, no? because we find critical pairs for rules with negative applications 
uh, such that one critical pair can be extended via such a monomorphic or injective morphism to another critical pair. And what was the idea of these critical pairs for negative application conditions at that time? It was to build negative application conditions from overlaps of the negative application condition of the rule on the opposite side, so to say, with the co-match of the transformation, then inverse that, and then come to a context which doesn't only um, yeah, consist of the left-hand sides of both rules, but also but already um, has some part of the negative application condition fulfilled, and then this rule um, adds something that makes the application condition, uh, the negative application condition, uh, really not fulfilled. No? So to, um, to, to not satisfy it, to partially not satisfy it, and here it's really not satisfied. So yeah, let's look for an improvement here. Now we have critical pairs, yes, for the rules with negative application conditions, but they are not minimally and complete. So let's try to do better. And um, we switch to the general case for trying to do better first, because somehow this general case um, um, yeah, also gives a good overview of what happens and what becomes more complex when we have application conditions at all. And one of the theorems that um, we could um, we could prove uh, last year is that when we have this um, first order logic on the application conditions of graph transformation rules, then it is not possible to find a finite and complete set of conflicts. So we don't need to look for it. It just doesn't exist. Therefore, um, in um, yeah, already earlier papers, this was something that we naturally did um, without having proved that fact, so to say. Um, we, we switched to symbolic transformation pairs in order to keep things finite. No? We represent transformation pairs in a symbolic way. What does that mean? This means that um, we have a transformation pair which doesn't necessarily satisfy the application conditions of the rules, but it, so to say, memorizes them in such a way that um, the application conditions here are translated into an extension act and the conflict-inducing act. What does this, this mean? The extension act means that we shift both application conditions to a minimal context again, for keeping things finite. No? And then it expresses that whenever we would extend this minimal context in such a way that the extension act is fulfilled, then um, we know that the matches for this extension will satisfy the application conditions. So that, that, that would be good. Um, and then there is a conflict-inducing act, and this is useful when we are uh, looking for extensions that are conflicting, because this one is fulfilled whenever we extend this minimal context into a context where we will have a conflict. So what this condition then um, expresses is that either we have a delete use conflict or we don't have a delete use conflict and we, we can um, shift this application condition that shouldn't be then fulfilled for the extended match to this conflict inducing act. That's the basic idea. On the example, um, we have computed this for you now because it's a bit, um, it can be automated, but um, it's a bit tedious to manually um, come up with these um, shifted application conditions. This one, the extension X for this example that we had before looks like this and now expresses that whenever we extend our transformation with a match satisfying this application condition, then we will um, get um, valid transformation pairs satisfying the application conditions. So now this one expresses that we may um, we may not have here uh, one additional node because then we would violate already the negative application condition. I simplified the application condition here a bit with respect to the former example, 
um, yeah, and so on. So the conflict inducing act then expresses that whenever we extend, for example, just by the identity, then we get a conflict. And this is the case. Now you can see this transformation pair is not only symbolic um, or cannot only be seen as a symbolic transformation pair, it is also a concrete um, conflict already. Um, because here um, we have an extended match that doesn't satisfy the negative application condition. So this is how we start um, working and computing with application conditions, conflicts, the notion of conflict um, in a symbolic way. No? And then we can start talking again about finitely representative sets of symbolic information pairs now. Um, and what does this mean? And this is just a generalization of the completeness that we have seen before. Um, we just need to make sure that the extensions that we have you know, for, for reaching con con completeness um, for the set of symbolic transformation pairs that we have now um, are um, defined in such a way that they satisfy these um, extension and conflict inducing application conditions if we want to have completeness for sets of conflicts. So yes, then um, everything works naturally or um, just continues naturally as before. We just always, in addition, have to think of the application condition. And as soon as we have uh, such a complete set or such an M-complete set of symbolic transformation pairs now um, with respect to all conflicts that might occur, then um, we need to make sure that this finite set satisfies this extra condition, which was called strict confluence in the plane case. And now we have strict AC confluence. The reason is simply that now we have to make sure that the solutions that we find for our um, critical pairs no? or symbolic critical pairs, as we will see in a minute, that they um, need to satisfy the application conditions of the strict confluence solution that we find. So this means that we gather all the information that we have for the symbolic transformation pair, which um, is um, the conflict inducing act and extension act. And then we check if this um, condition implies that the solution that we have found, the strict solution that we have found to make um, the system locally confluent will be really confluent uh, because the application conditions that are in addition present now need to be satisfied. So, yeah, in taking this idea, we can now, as in the plain case, again, define symbolic. Now we can define critical pairs again, no? following the M. Um, completeness notion or M representative notion just in a symbolic way. So we take symbolic transformation pairs that do not necessarily need to satisfy the application conditions that are around in the rule now, but they have to, as in the plain case, be jointly epimorphic because we have to keep the set as minimal as possible. And um, we have to make sure that in order for them not to be superfluous from the beginning, that there exists at least one conflict that we can deduce from such a symbolic critical pair. Here is an example of a symbolic critical pair um, for a pair of rules here just with a negative application condition again to keep things simple. Um, yeah, and um, as you can see this um, this is a critical pair because we have a jointly epimorphic situation here. You know, one comes from here and three comes from there. We do not necessarily need to glue anything. Um, we still get a critical pair because um, we have these AC conflicts. You know, and um, for an AC conflict um, to appear, it is enough that these extended matches exist and one of them doesn't satisfy the application condition. And here, this is the case um, already um, for the symbolic critical pair, but it could also happen 
um, with further expansions. So now we have symbolic critical pairs and uh, it was shown that they are M complete and it can be shown similarly as in the plain case that they are minimally M complete. So we can fill out our overview table um, and now um, we know here you know, that we definitely cannot find a set of conflicts that are concrete, you know, but we can find symbolic critical pairs that do more or less also a good job. Um, they are just a bit more abstract maybe you now because they, they have these application conditions, this conflict and expansion application condition that express a lot of information also in a symbolic way. Um, but they are minimally uncomplete, so that's good. Um, <clears throat> let's have a look if we can also come up um, with a kind of um, um, yeah, generalization or improvement also, because we do not need to require that the extensions are monomorphic. And then we can maybe even reduce also these symbolic sets of transformation pairs. And this was indeed possible to do that. Uh, the only thing that we needed to add was also again relying on the idea that now we do not necessarily have only delete use conflicts, we also have conflicts that arise when both morphisms here exist. So we get new initial transformation pairs, if you will, that we need to take care of. And these are exactly those that consist of um, just as in the example, just uh, putting L1 and L2 disjointly together because all the expansions will be parallel independent in a plain way, but they still might um, violate the application conditions in some way. This we express with the conflict inducing and extension act. Yeah? So we, we have this symbolic information there, but on, on the structural transformation pair level, we use the initial parallel independent transformation pair to express that we have an AC conflict and not a delete use conflict. And then we um, are there already with the symbolic initial conflict. So rules with application conditions that either consist of an initial conflict as before, as in the plain case, these conflicts are still there, or when we have an AC conflict, which is not connected to any delete use conflict, then we can represent it by the initial parallel independent transformation pair together with the information that is, of course, memorized here. This is yeah, how, how do we get this AC conflict then no? from the initial parallel independent transformation pair. Um, yeah, and that's it. And it, it improves um, yeah, even more than in the, in the plain case because we become even more compact, so to say, in the way we, we symbolically represent than all these AC initial conflicts because they are represented by this one um, parallel independent transformation pair. It is also minimally complete um, because yeah, for the plain case, it was already minimally complete and we add one more um, at most. So we, we remain um, minimally complete uh, also in the initial case. Um, we see here one example of such a symbolic initial conflict. In fact, the symbolic transformation pair that I've shown you before was already such a symbolic initial conflict. And as you can see here, no, there exists concrete conflicts with um, uh, AC conflicts that then um, can be represented by a not um, monomorphic morphism um, with this unique initial parallel independent transformation pair. So the table becomes filled, becomes more filled. Um, and yeah, um, this means that now um, we have here a similar situation as above. We just can reduce still um, the set of critical pairs considerably and um, uh, be minimally complete in a more general way. So not using injective extensions, but general extensions. Now the question still remains when we look at this overview, what happens here? Now, how can we make this minimally incomplete? Maybe in a concrete way, because here we are symbolic. Yeah? And do initial conflicts exist for this case? 
or not, real concrete ones, not symbolic ones. And we might have this also here, the, do their, uh, do special cases of application conditions or, or rule pairs exist where we come again to a concrete uh, set. So to come to concrete uh, sets of minimally complete um, conflicts because the symbolic ones are maybe a bit also harder to understand and um, not so easy to grasp therefore. So um, this is what we have been investigating uh, lately um, in, in terms of yeah, making um, a condition or constructing a condition, a sufficient one that makes sure that we indeed uh, can find again concrete complete sets or m complete sets of conflicts also in the setting of application conditions. And this happens when these um, conflict in using and extension acts show a certain type of regularity that we can discover automatically with automatic reasoning techniques for graph properties. And this regularity means that we can unfold this condition into a disjunction of so-called negative remainders. This means that whenever we find this AE or this XE, yeah, and then um, the condition here will automatically be fulfilled um, because of the structure of the negative remainder. I'll go a bit quicker now because it becomes more technical and I also want to conclude a bit with, with going over related work. Um, ah, it's snowing in the meantime here. <laughs> Um, yeah, so in this case, we can um, obtain finite M complete unfoldings or M complete sets of concrete conflicts, not symbolic ones anymore. So this is interesting. Uh, we just need to check if the applications that with the application conditions that we have um, on the initial conflicts, the symbolic ones, show a certain type of regularity and luckily the negative application conditions show this type of regularity because when we shift these types of conditions onto the conflict inducing act then we will see that we indeed get a disjunction um, again of um, positive application conditions that have a negative um, application condition or a set of negative application conditions again, such that um, as we already knew in the negative application condition case, we indeed get um, M complete sets, concrete ones of critical pairs. No? Um, this is an example here yeah, that we can find by unfolding the symbolic initial conflict. Um, and yeah, Therefore, um, the neck case is for the neck case. It will be doable you know, to um, to find again a concrete setting that we can investigate. Um, but we still have the problem that we, we knew that before already. We want minimal sets, um, and we want also these initial uh, conflicts that are not symbolic. And we can address this issue. Um, by reducing sets of concrete transformation pairs um, and getting rid of all the ones that are, so to say, um, still in the set um, and that can be extended to each other. This is the basic idea. And as soon as we have an M complete set of conflicts, as in the case of negative application conditions or regular application condition, conditions, this means that we can build from these um, unfolding minimally M complete or also minimally complete sets. So this, this is why we can now fill out the table here. And we can answer yes, here, yes, here. Um, in the regular cases or also in the case of negative application conditions. And we can use these maximal M reductions to really um, find the, yeah, the minimally M complete sets or the minimally complete sets. Um, so this is um, yeah, what, what historically um, summarizes more or less the situation that we reach. Um, 
Fernando started no, with the very first, um, with referring to the very first paper of, of Douglas Trump um, on, on hypergraphs and critical pairs and, and how um, confluence um, was investigated for the first time in the, in the context of graph transformation. It was generalized to other types of transformation systems, but always keeping uh, here the M settings, so representing sets of conflict and extending them monomorphically. And then this was generalized here for the initial conflict case to rules without application conditions and with application conditions by looking at what if um, we start playing with these extensions and don't have any um, M uh, monomorphic extensions anymore, but make them general. You know? um, and yes, this, this was done this evolution here was, was basically re repeated for the application condition case. And now we are in a situation where we know that when certain regularities hold for the application conditions, we can build M complete sets of conflicts, concrete ones, not only symbolic ones, but concrete ones um, for the M case or the not M case. Um, so here also in the historical overview, one sees now that this switch from M representing and not M representing um, um, conflicts with M extensions or not was somehow um, a clue to, to getting to the situation we have now. Um, remembering again uh, that when we generalize these extensions, then um, we can get rid of certain uh, critical pairs um, and we can reduce the set of critical pairs that needs to be investigated as a finite and representative set of conflicts considerably to a, a smaller set of initial conflicts. Um, and now we know more or less how to do that in all cases. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the objective that we had in the beginning of the talk, finding finite and representative sets of conflicts that are as small as possible in order to make the confluence and confluence analysis more efficient has conceptually or theoretically more or less um, been solved and investigated. Um, to conclude the talk, I would like to um, show you an overview of further related work. A lot of people have been working on, on this topic, so I, I want to at least hear uh, we want to at least mention here some of that work um, and we summarize it a bit into different kind of related works. So we have works that are considered with investigating confluence in the M adhesive setting as we have done here for our results. But for example, here transferring local confluence analysis results from one M adhesive system to the other or also investigating other types of um, yeah, expressiveness or rule expressiveness or transformation expressiveness, adding amalgamation or inheritance uh, to the graphs and the rules, um, investigating confluence in, in the reactive systems setting. We had a presentation on that a few uh, weeks ago, or I think it's one and a month ago already, um, for graph programs and also for handling attributes and attribute computations and yeah, investigating what a conflict means there and, and how to make also there um, the confluence theory complete. Uh, what has been investigated here usually is um, the critical pair setting and not the initial conflict setting yet. So this would be future work. Then we have uh, different types of tool support, AGG, um, is, a, is a classical tool in graph transformation where conflict detection was implemented. So only detecting this finite and representative set of conflicts, but not checking confluence. And this is something that not a lot of tools um, offer. I think ZGraph does. Um, but usually the conflict detection analysis is of course the first step and is implemented. And in Henshin, there is even support for um, initial conflicts. Um, we have CGRAPH, which is a tool that arises that arose in the model-driven engineering setting, and a very graph which tries to cope also with this M adhesive setting in, in an elegant way. 
then we have a lot of uh, related work that tries to yeah, think more about, okay, why is this uh, problem indecidable in the graph transformation case? How can we make it decidable by restricting a little bit the setting in, in which transformations um, can happen um, by ensuring that they have interfaces and, and therefore strict confluence is more or less automatically uh, fulfilled as soon as we have confluence. And we have um, here approaches that try to get rid of superfluous critical pairs, so even reduce um, more in certain settings. And then, um, yeah, we have here um, drag rewriting label transition system transformations that are special cases. So we, we try to find restricted conditions under which the confluence analysis becomes um, decidable or, or more efficient. Um, and then this type of work is considered basically with this conflict detection or conflict analysis case, the second scenario I talked about in, in the beginning mainly, and tries to present conflicts in such a way that they are easily understandable and maybe also showing not, not the conflict as a whole, but only the conflict reason for a conflict. And uh, it has been investigated here that the conflict reason can even be composed of so-called atomic conflict reason, and that that is very suitable to only show really relevant information for inspecting conflicts um, in a complete way. Um, yeah, this is the related work um, section of the whole talk. I'll uh, switch to this slide again, and I hope um, we didn't take too much time. I think it's more or less okay. Um, and I would like to thank everybody for listening and we are happy to answer some of your questions. Okay, thank you very much, Lean and, 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 and Fernando, of course. Um, yeah, very nice. So I, I, I really like, uh, enjoyed that, that, that overview and also the, the sort of historical picture you showed um, at the end. So, so we have 30 years of um, confluence then, apparently, and, and, um, and we even have the original um, the author here. So, so, so if, he, if he is still here, I think he's still here. <laughs> so, so that is very good. Um, I was wondering, um, I mean, you, it looks like you sort of covered the area and answered all the interesting questions. So, so the, the, the obvious conclusion is, the obvious question is what, what, what comes next? Is there any sort of, yeah, we what have, are the new challenges? What are applications based on this as, that you think uh, would, 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 would basically sort of keep you busy for the next 30 years, if you like? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not quite, but yeah. Can you comment on that? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, one interesting, if I may start answering the question, uh, Fernando. Uh, yeah, you can start. Um, I think one interesting line of work is, is this usability issue. We started working on that, I think, quite um, successfully, and it was really nice to do this work um, and, and um, yeah, see that um, for this conflict analysis scenario, we can we can really think of this initial conflict as a complete, minimally complete set of conflicts, but even there, um, yeah, come up with new concepts in order to show or confront the user of such a technique really, um, even with, with a reduced set of information. So we don't show the user their initial conflict as a whole, um, but only a subset again of that with this method of showing only conflict reasons. This means that we just show where the rules need to overlap in order to get a conflict, more or less. No? Um, and we don't show composed conflict reasons. So, reasons. so when um, two rules um, may overlap in, in two different uh, paths, uh, then we don't show um, the case where they do overlap in, in in these both parts, but only in, in this atomic part. And this reduces, again, the type of information that a user needs to cope with. Um, and this type of, of 
yeah, thinking needs to be extended. Um, it's not done yet. It's only there for the plain case. It needs to be extended to the negative application condition case. Um, I'll show you this overview again here. No? Um, now we know that, um, yeah, we, we will be able to find initial conflicts, but we, we need to investigate how does this set really look like? How can we construct it effectively? So we have declarative types of definitions here. Um, we, we have to come up with a constructive definition, for example, that um, implement algorithms that then really are efficient and um, yeah, ready to be used. So this is one line of work that is interesting to, to follow further and um, to then also extend to the application condition case. And then of course, um, what, I, what I have shown here, no? um, usually we don't have type graph transformation in applications we have um, yeah, in, in, in the object-oriented setting, we have inheritance and all these types of things. So um, it's not um, it's not solved yet how they are all the concepts that we that we have presented here really look like precisely. You know? So these new initial types of concepts. Um, all also the yeah. The, the efficiency that we could go gain here by looking at conflict reasons and composing them into atomic conflict reasons could be investigated here on the confluence side. Can we use this, um, this improvement also for the confluence analysis? This is not clear. This is a main open question. Um, yeah, and maybe um, Fernando can continue talking about here. Um, yeah. I, th I think that you said everything. So for me, <laughs> yeah, for me, the thing that for me was more clear that it's in a way lacking is, uh, as you said, uh, finding constructive methods. So this, some of these results uh, tell you how you can build in theory, but they are very declarative. And if you try to use them, sometimes you may have to go into computing all overlaps and, uh, and this may be too costly. And uh, so finding more con concrete methods, I think is something that it's needed. And uh, also in order to be to implement them in, in a tool or so. Yeah. Yeah, in particular, because the case here, uh, we have uh, done a literature survey of all, yeah, other application oriented work where the conflict detection and analysis and confluence analysis techniques are used. And of course, all, most, almost all these cases work with a type of expressiveness that is higher than what we typically have in plain type graph transformation. So we have this setting, no? and that's why we have to get into that um, in order to really sort um, this theory um, to the application-oriented world. Mm -hmm. OK. Well, thank you very much. Um, I suggest that we move to the private part uh, now of that of that of that meeting, yeah, and we can can continue the discussion. We have a few more uh, uh, questions, at least two, as I can see, um, but we can continue that in the, without without the YouTube channel. Okay, so I suspect. Yeah, so I'll just quickly 